So anyway, I told you about London. I know most of you knew that Missy and I, we traveled overseas. Uh, that's why Pastor Tim came up here last Sunday and gave a great message, and Pastor Al before that, and Nate after that. It was, it was an amazing trip. You guys, I think, know the reason we went was to attend a wedding of, of my relatives, of my cousin, and it was that she, a Hindu, and he, a Muslim. And that's a very uncommon, uh, well, people don't get married who are Muslims and Hindus that much, okay? Let's just put it that way. And so we were able to attend, and it came kind of last minute. I, I, my dad, who is the patriarch of the family, because of health issues, because of other stuff, he wasn't able to go. I'm next in line. So he calls me and he says, hey, son, can you go to a wedding for, for us, for me? And I'm like, daddy, if, it, if it's Easter weekend, it ain't going to happen. And he's like, no, it's the next weekend. So that's how we actually ended up going to it last week. Um, so we're in this, it's a Sarah, probably 180 people or so, something like that. Missy and I, the only Christians. We were it. We were the only Jesus lovers in there. And there were probably 40, 50, 60 Hindus in there, and then about 100 plus Muslims. And most of the Muslims were on that side of the floor, and most of everybody else were, we were on this side of the floor. And, but, you know, one thing about Muslim weddings, I don't know how many of you actually have attended a Muslim wedding, but really what it is is this. A, quote, holy man um, reads uh, 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 scriptures from the Quran, and it has to do with, you know, the role of husband, the role of wife, and it usually, no kidding, the whole ceremony takes five or ten minutes. That's it. You know, a Christian, we do it, it probably takes an hour or so. They just sit there and they read, and it's kind of like, you know, the next person reads, and it's kind of like the next person reads, and that's it. So we were sitting there, and Missy and I were watching this, really praying. And I know you guys were too, just that we would be lights uh, in such a dark place that we would be able to represent Jesus well, even by the way we carried ourselves, by the way we spoke to each other, by the way we spoke to them, just everything. You guys know that's what you do as Christians, right? And so we prayed together and we, we, we thanked God that we had that opportunity. So we're all sitting in tables, right? Groups of like eight or 10, and it's all over the place. And it's for dinner and, and all of that. So God, God's like, yes, because God seats me right next to a guy. He's like 30-ish. And I'll tell you what, you guys, this is what Indians do. You ask each other about your education and you ask each other about your career, your position. It's like, what have you accomplished? Okay, that's it. And he's like some kind of software engineer like all of my cousins and stuff are, you know, they're <laughs> engineers or doctors or Motel 6 owners or whatever. <laughs> and so, so or 7-Eleven owners, yeah. <laughs> the funny thing is, you guys, it's true. Like, I'm not even just sitting here, standing here saying it. So, so I ask him, you know, he's telling me, you know, I got this and I've got software engineering and I got whatever. Actually, I was telling, I think I was telling Ryan, he's like, so what about your Brit British accent? I told him, you know what, dude? My Indian accent got deeper because I was more around them than I felt like I was around the Brits, you know? So like, so what do you do? And, and they say back. <laughs> I, I was hoping to say it British Lee, but I said it Indian Lee. Um, you see how we can go off on rabbit trails when we're up here? So he tells me all about himself. And naturally, he asks back, so what do you do? And you know he's expecting one of those typical answers. And I'm like, okay, Lord, here goes. And, and so I, I started it by saying, it was something like this. Well, 
I'm a religious man. And I knew instantly that that was going to make him, like, sort of sit back and really listen now to how I was going to complete the statement. And so I told him, well, you guys, uh, clergy, I said, over in America, I'm, I'm a pastor, and what I do is I lead a church. It's a Christian church, and I teach the Bible uh, a couple of times a week and, you know, follow Jesus. Now, by this time, he's floored, and you <laughs> can see it on his face. So food starts coming. Things start happening, and it was the coolest thing because he finds my eyes through, through all of the commotion, and he, he's like, and mate, I still want to talk to you about that. <laughs> is that Australian or English? I'm not sure <laughs> which one it is. <laughs> They're close enough. But um, so, so already he was like hungry. Already he wanted to know more about what it is that I had to say. Listen, I told first service this, Christian, you are magnetic. You got to understand that we are spiritual creatures. And when we appeal in the spirit, it's like the magnet, the forces have been turned on. They will listen and suddenly that part gets kicked on. And they will look at you eye to eye, you know, through the commotion and they'll say, I want to know more about what it is that you have to say. And so there it is, the Lord starting something. By the way, this is going to be my story. Missy doesn't have a chance to tell you, but she had an opportunity as well to share the gospel, to share my message with a woman who was married to a Muslim who was prominent in this community. So let's see what happens, right? So I, um, uh, uh, what does I say? Oh, yeah, so the commotion sort of settles down. And he goes, you know, so tell me what you meant. And I start telling him my, my conversion story. You know, a lot of you know my, my story and what happened back in 97, back in the hot summer day in Pasadena. And I told him what Jesus did was he revealed himself. He spoke to me. And he said, Raj, now is the time. You need me. This is the time for you to come to me. And I told him I was just blown away because I knew of the reality of the situation. I didn't stop there. I said, and the reason why I knew it was real is because it conformed to the words of God. Like I, I wasn't just feeling it or pretending it was there. Everything that I heard, the challenge that was posed to me by heaven is here. So it, it, you know, it confirmed it. And I told him, you know, that's why I knew that what was happening to me was real. And I said, my wife came home and, and led me and I received Jesus. And I said, from that day on, man, life has been changed. And then I explained to him about teaching the Bible and why I do it. And, and he's, you know, enthralled. So he tells me he's an atheist. It's funny because he basically describes me in my old life. He said, I'm an atheist. I went through the motions with my parents, you know, the Hindu things. I had, you know, Muslim friends and Buddhist friends, and I respected what they did and what they believed, but I never believed it. And I was like, dude, that's me. That's exactly the way I grew up. And so he's telling me a little bit more about why he doesn't believe. And here was the question that sort of hung in the end. He goes, so Raj, how do you know that it's true? How do you know that it's true? And what he was challenging me was, how do I know that this Bible, because remember, I compared my conversion to the Bible. He goes, well, how do you even know that that Bible is true? And here was an opportunity to share the truth, the reality of God's word. Here he is saying, how do you know it's just not a bunch of wise men who wrote their thing and it all got pieced together 
and now you have your Bible. And I, I told him, well, listen, I said, you have, you know, I, I gave him some of the proof, all the texts, all the original uh, manuscripts that we have, how the history always conform to history about prophecy. And then one of the things that really challenged him was this. I said, you have to understand, Jesus himself believed that the word of God was true. I told him in 60 different locations, you can find Jesus who says, in essence, this is what the word says. This is what God says. And I said, you know, Jesus, he's, he's Christianity. I said, so if the source of Christianity says that this is the truth, who, who am I to challenge that? And I said, every apostle, every prophet, in some way or another, made the claim, this word is true, hence my life is based on it. And these are the things that really were compelling him. He'd never heard stuff like this before. And so... It was, it was really cool, you guys, and I know you were praying for us. God answered prayers. Right now, the way it left was he just hanging on what I said. And as the evening went on, you know, we sort of separated and did our own thing, I realized that I was going to be teaching 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13, and it's the most amazing thing because it's Paul thanking God that the people of Thessalonica responded to the word as truth, and they received it in their hearts and were converted and responded to it by seeing their lives transformed. You understand, that's what verses 13, 14, 15, and 16 are. In essence, it's, <laughs> okay, I'll use this, this parallel, okay? It's like Paul at a Muslim Hindu wedding sharing the word of God to an atheist and the atheist goes, okay. And then Paul jumps up and down and he says, yes. And he writes him a letter and he goes, I'm so thankful because this is what you did. And that happened, let's see, how long was Paul there in Thessalonica? Four, it says three Sabbaths. Let's just say three weeks, okay? So three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so I figure, okay, God, you gave me that the one week that's passed. Would you like save him in the next two weeks? That would be just so cool. The, you know, he hears the word and he receives it as God's word and he responds to it and he's transformed. And um, Maybe, you guys, is it a coincidence that I happened to be who Paul is? in my next teaching to you? No way. Do you know what I was studying prior to going to London? I was studying the message of Paul sharing the truth of God's word to unbelievers. That's what God does. You know that? He loves you. He wants to use you, and he prepares you in the most amazing ways, ways that you would never think of. You guys, but you got to be ready. you got to be open to it. you got to be just bold to it. Look, it was, an intimidating, it was an intimidating setting. Missy and I is the only one there. It's intimidating. Those people have their opinions about what you and I believe, and those opinions ain't good. And so here we just got to step up and do it. Oh, I hope that excites you. Who knows whatever you are in right now and you're like, what am I in this for? What am I doing this for? Why am I in this job? What about this new relationship? What about, what about, hey, maybe that's God prepping you to be that Paul in Thessalonica. That's what we study today. That's why it's just so exciting. God does that all the time. So here's what we will do. I'm so far ahead of myself. Here's what we'll do. Let's pray and then we'll look at the text. Let's see what the Lord does through this Paul and to these people, okay? Lord, thank you for you being God. Lord, for you having a perfect plan. Lord, a will for every single one of us. And God, we are just privileged. We are thankful, we're grateful. And here we are assembled together 
as the body of Christ. And we want to be built up in the things of Christ. Lord, we want to learn and grow in the word of Christ. And then God, use us. And then God, give us boldness and, and wisdom. Lord, give us all that we would need. Prep us to be able to take what we have, your, your power, your strength, and share it with a world that needs it so badly. And Lord, if you brought anybody here this morning who doesn't have a personal relationship with you, or maybe who's turned their back on you, God, we pray today you would draw them in to that intimate and awesome relationship with you. We pray that by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. So, in Paul's presentation, so to speak, of the Word of God, he describes what happens. He is thankful because of the results of what happens, and that's what we're going to go through, okay? Sort of piece by piece, because it's inspiring to us. It prepares us. It tells us what we're supposed to expect when we share, and even more so, how we're supposed to respond. Okay, so here is, I, I tried to use our words, except you're going to notice the last word I used is the word wrath, because I couldn't think of an R word, so at least I got the sound of R in there, okay? So I wasn't confused. I know, R and W are different words, nevertheless. All right, so number one is the, oh, maybe we ought to read the text. Verse 13, look at it. He says, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Okay, just stop there. So twice in one sentence, Paul calls his words the word of God. Two times He says, these are so clearly God's and not mine. This young man there at dinner was basically trying to challenge me in this, saying, Raj, how do you know that these are the words of God and not just the words of some wise men? Well, there's an answer. Look, here's Paul sort of giving us that answer right now. He's in Thessalonica. He goes to the synagogue. He goes to the city streets and he shares the word of God. By the way, when we say word of God in New Testament context, can I tell you this? Two things. Number one, word of God. It is the gospel message. Okay. The good news of Christ. That would be one that is included in this term word of God. Number two, is the Old Testament scripture and specifically how Jesus is the the one that the Old Testament scripture is speaking about. Okay, so every time you hear word of God, the scriptures, anything like that, it's one of two things, the gospel or the Old Testament scripture relating to Christ. Okay, so he says, here's what happened in my three weeks there. First, you guys heard me. Okay, look at the word heard. In my Bible, I got a number one next to the word heard, okay? Uh, Paralambano in the Greek. And what that means, you guys, is this. It, It means to listen objectively, okay? To listen openly. To listen honestly. Paul goes, I knew when I was preaching to you that you were actually objective in receiving my words. He goes, that's how you knew that these were not my words, but these were God's words. It's just because you had an objective um, heart, an open heart to, to, to hear these words. In... Chapter after chapter, in letter after letter, Paul claims that he is speaking the word of God. And I want to get into that in a little detail too later on. 
But in chapter 2 and verse 2, he goes, we declared to you the gospel of God. Remember what I said? Gospel is one of those. Verse 8, the gospel of God. Verse 9, the gospel of God. Basically, Paul said it, but God originated it. Paul wrote it, but God was the author of it. And that was the truth, and that is the truth behind every word that is contained in these scriptures. Um, remember what I said? It, it becomes magnetic. It's just built into us to want to know more. I have this dream. Like, I seriously, I've got a dream. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 44, you don't have to go there, but it says that the whole city assembled together to hear the word of God. The whole city. You guys, it's, it's built into them. You get the word there. You tell them your testimony or you explain these things. There is a draw. And I want, I want the city, you know what? I got to share the gospel Thursday night at the courthouse to a few hundred people. Like, yes. But I want it to be a few tens of thousands of people to be gathered to hear the word of God. I don't want them to hear my words what a waste. What confusion that would sow. But the word of God? And Paul is saying, yeah, that's what I got to do. Man, when Paul and Barnabas were there in the city, the city assembled to hear it. Okay, look at your first note. Here's the way I'm wording it. We speak, and I'm talking about all Christians now. Paul, you and I, we've got it right here. We speak the word, but God is the source of the word. We speak He's the source. Paul goes, we spoke the gospel. Jesus is the source of the gospel. He goes, we spoke the word, but God is the source of the word. And that's what you heard. And that's why he was so happy. Thank you for hearing objectively. That's why you knew that these weren't just me, I'm blabbering, but this is God's message. Now there's a part two. He changes the verb. He goes from heard to accepted. Dekomai in the Greek. And what that means is they went from hearing the word objectively in their ears to receiving the word as real in their hearts. So it went from head to heart. That was, that was why he was, he was so so excited, okay, that next note of yours, they receive God's word by hearing with their ears and accepting with their hearts. I'll tell you what that verb is equivalent to, okay? It's, it's like welcoming somebody into your home, like opening your front door and saying, welcome, come in. So just imagine this, okay? The gospel is at the front door of these Thessalonians, and they're kind of listening, you know, then maybe they got, they're kind of, yes, how can I help you? And they listen and they're like, whoa. And once they hear what it all means, they say, come on in. They take it from ear to heart, uh, from head to heart. And put those two together. Ear, heart. This is them receiving the gospel message, okay? So the word receive is the umbrella word of heard and accept. You got it? Salvation is to receive, but receiving involves two things, hearing and accepting. That is, sal that, that's, that's the salvation experience, now, the thing that's so important about you and I realizing this is this, you guys, it takes the pressure off because the ear part, okay, I got, I can speak, you know that. I can speak into an ear and I hope that when I speak the gospel message, they understand that they're hearing God's word. But then there's an element to the process that takes Raj out of the picture, takes stress off of me. And that's where it goes between themselves and God. 
There has to be now a spiritual work in their lives for them to become saved. This is where their hearts must be open to the, to the prodding, to the working, to the transforming of the spirit, taking what is dead and bringing it to life. And that's not something I can do, and that's not something you can do. But praise God, we don't have to. You see, when you share God's word, take the pressure off of yourselves. Like, share the gospel. You know, share the word. And then look up to heaven and say, Dear God, thank you for giving me the opportunity that matters. I leave it in your hands. And you guys, I know how hard that prayer is to, to express when it's your beloved family and they reject it. It's so hard sometimes just to go, okay, God, I leave it in your hands. I want to get behind. I want to do something. God, give me another plan. God, give me another script. God, do something so that they can get converted when I tell them the story. And God says, wait a minute. Rod, do you understand the essence of this? It is, a, it is a spiritual transformation from my enemy to my friend, from a child of the devil to a child of God. That's way beyond you. But you know who I am. In fact, look at yourself. You were one of those ones. And that's when I'm supposed to sit back and go, oh, you're right. And that's what you and I are supposed to do. That's why we can stand on city squares and just preach the gospel. That's why we can answer, quote, tough questions with the simplicity of the Bible. That's why, that's why you are a soldier. Man, you're called a soldier in the army of God. You are an ambassador for God. You, you've been equipped. Take what you've been given and go and give. This is why Paul is jumping up and down. You guys, I just gave you what I had. Lo and behold, you opened the door, came in. Now you're one of my brothers. Now you're one of my sisters. This was the Thessalonian church. This um, Acts, by the way, the whole story is in Acts 17, but it says in Acts 17, verse 4, here, come, here comes the receive, okay? Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. Oh, people accuse Christianity of being sexist, you know, the Bible, come on. But anyway, that's another topic. Nevertheless, it's like, bam, you know, reception happened. You know what happened? Uh, Acts 17, verse 4, Calvary Chapel of Thessalonica got planted that day. And Paul's really happy. So can we be like that? And can we rejoice that God has taken the stress off of us? And can we expect that God is going to do great things? Yes. Can I add a, let me do a follow-up question. This has to do with Paul. So the guys and gals, the unbelievers, they knew it was God's word and they respond. Are we absolutely sure that Paul knew that what he was giving was God's word to be received? Because I was, not on this trip, but I was challenged. Actually, I've been challenged many times. Something like this. Raj, you give Paul too much credit. Like, like he was wise and he had godly things to say, but come on, be the mouthpiece of God? And I've heard that about Peter and John when I say those things. Did Paul know? Or did I make it up for Paul? And the answer is, Paul knew. Indeed, he knew. 1 Corinthians 15, he goes, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached. Uh, I received it, and I passed it on. And then in Galatians 1, this is sort of my proof text right here, Galatians 1, verses 11 and 12. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, 
Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. You think Paul knew that he was giving what should be received because it was God's? You bet. You bet. Let us be oh so confident. Oh, let us be ever so bold because just like Paul, we got it and we get to give it. So he was thankful for that as well. Okay, so third, my next follow-up question. Let me tell you the first one. Did the Thessalonians know they were to receive it because it was God's word? Answer, yes. Did Paul know he was giving God's word? Answer, yes. Let's forward 2,000 years now to this day. How do we know that it is God's word. Now, let's put aside all the proof texts and things. I understand. I want to remain in the context of, verses, of verse 13. This is going to be our answer. Look, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. Now, here comes the answer, which is at work in you, believers. It's, it's, it's the word work. Uh, energeo. You know where we, what word we get from that? Energy. It's activity. In fact, some of your Bibles say perform. It's performance. It's operation. And you know what's so cool is that word in the Bible, in the New Testament, is almost always used to describe the work of God. And, well, I'll throw up a couple of my favorite um, cross-references. Philippians 2, verse 13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Okay, how about this one? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 6. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Notice, your efforts are superseded by God's efforts. And that is, that is amazing. You want to talk about a confidence builder? Again, God takes the stress off of you, beloved he says, don't you worry. You just go and do, and actually watch what I'll do through you. That's, you guys, that's how we know that this is inspired and true God in this word. You understand that you are the object. You are the object of the work of God, and that through you, the work of God is like, like, uh, um, shared, espoused, given to the people around you. It's, it's like we know that to be the case as much as the Thessalonians knew that the word of God was what it was, as much as Paul knew that the gospel given to him was what it was. And they acted. Man, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2 is all about the Thessalonians acting on what they got. Does that describe your life? Does that describe what happens because of the word of God? Okay, the, the ultimate subject here is the word of God. Is that what happens to you because of this, this word of God? You understand, you take it in and work from heaven happens in your heart. And that's why I've got this list in this little box right here. Okay, <laughs> it's a 22-point list. By the way, let me, let me say this as well. This is a list that I have studied for many years, but it is not my list. It is one that I am passing along to you because it is just powerful, and I hope encouraging, and I hope exhorts you. Can we describe now why I have the list? Because we know... The word of God is real. How? Because when we receive the word of God, God by his power makes them come alive in us. 
this list of 22 is a part of that, what comes alive. I told first service, in essence, this is what God does in us, to us, and through us. Okay? There's our background. Now listen to this cool list. Ready? <clears throat> By the way, it's not going to come up on the screen. I just want you to listen. Okay. Firstly, it blesses us. This is Luke chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus says, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. What about Paul in some of our favorites? 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. The word of God teaches us. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching. It rebukes us. It is useful for rebuking. It corrects us. It is useful for correcting. It's useful in training us in righteousness. Verse 17, it also thoroughly equips us for every good work. Okay, how else? Here comes that word of God, you guys. It's real and God's at work with it in you. It guides our lives. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It counsels us. Psalm 119, 24. Your statutes are my delight. They are my counselors. Colossians 1 says it makes us fruitful. The word of truth has come to you and is bearing fruit. Oh, and increasing. That's what it does because God's the one at work. It grows us. 1 Peter 2, verse 2, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. It warns us. Psalm 19, verse 11, by the word your servant is warned. Same verse tells you it rewards us. It goes, in keeping them, there is great reward. How about this? God's word judges us, and that's a good thing. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul, uh, to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It sanctifies us. This is Jesus' prayer. Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. It cleanses us. John 15, 3, Jesus says, Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. It frees us. John 8, 32, the truth will set you free. It enriches us. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And that leads to teaching and admonishing and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and thanksgiving. Uh, gives you great joy, oh man. Is it the source of joy? 1 John 1, 4, we're writing these things so that your joy may be full. It protects us against sin. Psalm 119, 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And then this one, so appreciative. It strengthens us in grief. Psalm 119, 28, my soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. It makes us wise. Psalm 119, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate it on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. The word of God gives us hope. Psalm 119, 147. 
I have put my hope in your words. You guys, that's a list of 22. I could have given you a list of 122. That's the word that works in us. That's how we know it's true. It's, it, it, it blesses and teaches and rebukes and corrects and perfects and equips and guides and counsels and makes us fruitful and grows us and rewards us and, and, and sanctifies us and cleanses us and frees us and enriches us, gives us joy, gives us hope, gives us wisdom, prospers us, on and on and on. It goes. And so here's the verse or two verses, three verses that I'm going to ask you to meditate on over the coming weeks. Listen to this. Perfect summary right here. Psalm 19, beginning at verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. You want an experience with God's word? Meditate on Psalm 19, particularly verses 7, 8, and 9. Do you understand why Paul was so thrilled? Do you, Christian, you in your life as a Christian, it needs to be Th thrilling it you have the word of god and god works it effectually in your life he like man he gives you a power source that no human naturally could dare have or dare use i don't care how brilliant somebody is or how educated or <laughs> how many motel sixes they own or how wise they are, it just, that doesn't matter. They can never get these results. Only God can. So Paul recognizes their reception. They received, okay? And basically it answered the question, how do we know God's word is real? They knew they got it. Paul knew he told it. We know because God works it in us. Now, the next R word is respond. And it's, it's kind of short because it really connects closely to the first part of it. Paul recognizes the experience. Remember, they open the door, they become saved, and he recognizes the follow-up experience. In believing, they went to assimilating. And we don't use that word a lot. But to assimilate means to sort of to come in and to become one of, to adopt the way, uh, to make yourself no different than the others. You assimilate yourself. And in essence, what he was saying was, because you are Christians, you assimilated yourself into the Christ-like lifestyle. Like you're no different than Jesus. You guys, assimilation's a big part of Christianity. It's supposed to be like this. I've assimilated, meaning when you look at me, man, you're seeing Jesus. And, and Paul is so happy because that's what they've done. Now, if I can just give you a little notation about how you do it, it, it just goes like this, you guys. Responding to the word. Remember, that's my R word, responding. We respond to the word by studying it, by applying it, and by growing in it. Here comes the key, through God's power. Do you want to assimilate into, into Christ, you know, be sanctified? Then that's how you're going to do it right there. You're, it's, the word is going to be your source. You better study it. You better apply it. You better grow in it. And it's all by God's amazing power. I, I must exhort you. you know, I love, I love to study God's word. Like I can't even get enough of it. I spend a lot of time doing it. But, but I really do need to make sure, you guys, I'm not doing it just to fill my brain with facts. Like there's got to be a purpose behind it. And in essence, my purpose has to be the word respond, right? Like I teach you guys these things because I study it. But the first thing that I have to do, I told somebody at the door, 
Rod, you know, you were speaking to me in that message. I said, dude, listen, I have a mirror on my pulpit. I was speak. by the way, I really don't, but figuratively speaking, I have, a mir- I, I have to preach these things to myself. I've got to make sure that man, these become alive to me. This is, this is what, come on, Paul said, be imitators of me as I imitate who? Jesus. That's what I hope every Christian is able to say. That's what I hope your response is to the working of the reality of God's word in your life. Oh, don't be one of them, you guys. Don't. There is little time left. Don't stand there in the line at the store and just wish they would hurry up so that you could drive away. Okay? That's what they do. You know, you stand there with a smile, and if they can't figure out the little scanner, walk up to them and say, here, let me help you. (laughs) Although a lot of us don't know how to use a scanner. Still, you see somebody who's a little different or you hear them on the phone, you know what? They better know that there's something about you that they don't have to be intimidated by. They need to feel. So that's the way Missy and I were praying over there in London. We were praying that these people, man, it it is secular to the hilt in Europe. I mean, it is secular to the hilt. 90, I think the official, if this is from in 2007 or eight or something. I remember the official stats were something like in the 90% that people called themselves secular in the nineties. You know, America, we're like, like half or less call themselves secular. I mean, 90 plus percent, you know, God just, he said, Rod and Missy, if you don't represent me, (laughs) you're going down. Although, it's not like God said, I'm going to strike you dead, but you know. Are you responding to God's word and the reality of it like this? Oh, student. Oh, you know, example. Oh, model. And is God your power? Are you trying to do it yourself? Because you already know we'll fail if we do it ourselves. Would you, please, would you please study hard and study a lot? I genuinely believe that every Christian should have notebooks filled with notes about the Bible. I think your Bible should be marked up, scratched up, doggy ears, all kinds. Of, now, I use a tablet, so I mean, I can't do that exactly, but still. I think you, you got to remember, this is a couple of hours a week, and you have 168 hours in a week. So this must not be your primary source. You know, I can't be your source of study. You and the Holy Spirit, that's where you study from. You know, you get commentaries, get, watch other pastors, um, look up stuff. You know, looking up the Greek is pretty cool. It's pretty cool because it gives you new insight into certain, uh, con- into certain passages. Gives you new under- that's why I try to share that with you. Because I want to give you a, an enlightenment that perhaps you can't get in the English. But that's got to be something you do. Why? It's all this context, you guys. First Thessalonians chapter 2. This is living. This is active. This is God's work. This is God's power. And he's doing it in you and through you and to you because right now we are the ones he has called for such a time as this. And who are we to forsake that opportunity? Like, that's why I was like praying, God, bring the whole city to the courthouse on Thursday night. But you know, God did use us to win some people to to him, huh? How cool that was. I I have to finish. So I want to put verses 14 through 16. I put it sort of into one chunk. And And it's the other R word, which is the word react, Okay. So he says, for you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as, did, as they did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displease God and oppose all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Just stop there. Okay, now I'm talking about the reaction of the world to your receiving and responding to the word. Got it? To the word, by the world. 
Here it comes. It's the word opposition. A common reaction to God's word and his people, opposition. Yeah, you guys, Jesus said, hey, if they hate you, do you know why? Because they hated me first. Read a news article yesterday. It said 80% of, of all uh, persecutions, religious persecutions, 80% Christians. Okay, Four out of five people that are persecuted for their faith believe in Jesus and believe in his word. It says over 4,000 were martyred last year for being Christian. You don't hear about that stuff in the news, right? But it is the case. 250 got mowed down in Sri Lanka. I'll tell you what, all of those stats, they should shake us, but they should not shock us. That is simply the way it's going to be. Now, I would even go so far as this, okay? Don't think this sounds weird, but it should excite us because it really does mean that the word is living and active. It really does mean that God will work through his people. And there is a world that is ruled not by God, but who? The enemy of God. And so when he sees real work being done, you know what he's going to do? He's going to work to stop your work. And that's why Christians are the most persecuted. So that's why I said, hey, okay. That's what, that's what we have to understand in terms of reaction. And I'll leave it right there. Now, this is the crazy part, you guys. So I was done. This morning, I added more to my study. Like, I couldn't even stop. So I had to send the media booth more notes for the screen, which you don't have on your paper. I got to fly through these because they're just too cool. I want you to know this stuff. So I'm going to go for it, okay? Listen, I was reading through Paul's, uh, his writings, his epistles, the things that he had to say from jail. And you can see kind of a, a summary of why the world reacts the way it reacts to the word. And it goes like this. Here's going to be my first note that I'm adding. Because the word ignores man's achievements. Okay? I was in the midst of hundreds. Missy and I were in the midst of hundreds who said, my achievements matter to God. I have scored more points in the good than the bad. Therefore, I will receive God's favor. And when I take the Bible and I say, listen, dude, it's not really the case. The fact of the matter is that God's not impressed by what we do or what we achieve or anything else. He just says, all people come to me the same simple way, admitting they're sinners who can't do anything for themselves, accepting salvation as a gift through Christ. That's it. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. By grace you are saved through faith, and that's not of yourself, because I don't want anybody to boast. Um, let me get my other note up there, okay? The second reason is very close to the first because God's word exposes human pride. Like I said, it's very close, but the word there, or the, the topic there in my mind is the idea of self-sufficiency. See, we like to know that we are our own gods. People like to have the power unto themselves to do what they want to do, to set the standards they want to set. They want morality to be defined by themselves, not by somebody else. But the word comes along and says, nope, you ain't got no power. Nope, the standards have been set. Nope, morality is an absolute not relative. And people just hate it. And so they say, forget it. I ain't doing it. Okay, so that's the second one. So first of all, it shows that God is not impressed by any achievements. Next, it exposes human pride. And finally is this. It offers unconditional forgiveness equally to all people. I can't tell you how much flack I've gotten for this. I've explained the gospel and forgiveness through Christ, and here's a common one. You mean God will forgive Hitler or Stalin? Six million murders, 60 million murders? He would, he would forgive them and say, come on into heaven if they receive the gospel message like I would because I'm a pretty good person. And then when I, I try to explain, hey, listen, listen, here's the fundamental thing. 
God sees us all as sinners. We have missed the mark. It doesn't matter the extent of your sin, the depth of your sin. The fact of the matter is, sin is sin. That will require God, who is a God of justice, to impart punishment. And the punishment for sin, well, that's death. And what death means is eternal separation in hell. That's what a perfect God sees of all imperfection. So if you've killed 60 million people or said one lie, you have fallen short of the standard of perfection. That's all that matters. And God, God is so loving, though. God is such a God of mercy and grace. He says, but I have a way for you. I have that way that will take care of that consequence. It will impart justice once and for all. I am going to send perfection. I am going to send my son, the one who doesn't deserve death because he has never fallen short of the mark. And he is going to, upon himself, take that sin, take that shame, take that darkness, and he is going to die in your place. And because of who he is, I am going to call his payment satisfaction. Debt paid once and for all. And so I offer him as a gift to anybody who would receive him. They would simply confess, yes, I am a sinner. They would repent. They would turn from that sin, no, because now it's Jesus. And they will receive him through faith. I believe in you, Jesus, as my Savior. Savior means the one who saves. I believe in you as my Savior. And Jesus will adopt that role for the rest of eternity. He will become your Savior. You will be sealed, the Bible says, in the Spirit of God. No, nobody can remove you from that. I, I believe heartily and by the Word of God, when you're saved, you cannot lose your salvation. I know people argue, well, what happens if I would say then they weren't really saved? That's who God is. That's the wonder and the beauty and the power and the truth of the word. That's the work that was accomplished. And the question is, where are you in that? Have you received the gift? Have you been forgiven? Have you been sealed? because you have received Jesus as your Savior. Of course, the next part of it, please, is this, that he doesn't just become your Savior. He becomes your Master, your Lord. Jesus must be your Lord and Savior. You are now a follower of Christ for the rest of ever, and this again becomes your guide. And I wonder if there's any of you here who you know that you've never done that, you've never committed your life to Jesus. I can tell you this, you're not here by coincidence. You're here because God knew you needed to hear this truth. And I hope he freed you from some of the burdens you thought you would have in order to get saved. Some of the stuff you thought you had to do. What God just told you right now is, no, 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 no. I've taken care of it all. Now receive it. If that's you, now is your opportunity. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Would you all bow your heads?